<laughs> Welcome to Big Boat Church. I find it interesting this year, more than some of the other years that I've been doing sunrise services or Easter services or in some way talking about Jesus on the day that we call Resurrection Sunday or the day that we traditionally celebrate the day Jesus rose from the dead. Now, a lot of people, they, you know, kind of have a problem with that and they'll go along with it, like they'll show up for church or they'll go to a Easter sunrise service or some kind of service to do their duty. And you know, there's really nothing wrong with that because as most people know, hey, you know, when Jesus rose from the dead, he did it because he said he would. He prophesied, and it was written about him long before he was ever born, that he would one day be crucified. And then after three days and three nights, being in the grave, he would rise again. Well, just like you and just like me, he probably wasn't expecting to find his disciples there at the grave waiting for him to come bouncing out of the tomb. And sure enough, at sunrise, there was nobody there. I mean, probably long about the darkness as it began to change to the light, something happened that there, behold, the Son of God rose from the dead. We didn't see it. We only have the accounts of what we're told of what did occur. And they're accurate, 100%. But even not knowing or remembering that during Passover, during the time of the Jewish festival of God delivering the children of Israel from the bondage of Egypt, that Jesus was going to fulfill that traditional holy day, that holy week, by being crucified during it. And then on the first day of the week after the Passover, he would rise from the dead, as he said he would, being the Passover lamb, the lamb that was slain, the lamb that died and was offered for your sins and mine. And that's kind of where we get the whole Easter story from, is it's a part of Passover. Now, I'll admit this year it's been a little weird for me because it's kind of like, wait a minute, we just had Purim. I mean, if you're Jewish. Now, if you're not Jewish, maybe you understand the festival or the feast of Purim, Feast of Ruth, the time where the children of Israel were delivered by the faithfulness of a Jewish princess who had, by way of Mordecai, <clears throat> following his instructions, delivered the children from destruction from um, I want to say hangman, but it's not hangman. It's, <laughs> my mind is going definitely kind of like, you know, hangman. What happened to him? Well, he was hung. You know, it's kind of where some people get their hangman thing. But anyways, from uh, Mordecai and Esther and I want to say, boo, his, his. But anyways, this week has been with Purim for the Jew and celebrating that deliverance that was going to happen where all the children of Israel would have been wiped out. It's interesting that somehow this year Easter was taken out of Passover and almost a month away the Jewish Easter will occur on May 1st this year. Now if you ask me how that happens, eh, you know, traditions are traditions. So really what I want to talk about today is tradition. Tradition, tradition. What else would I be talking about? Boy, such a deal. But traditions aren't necessarily good, and they aren't necessarily bad. They're just traditions. Everyone's got a tradition. I mean, some people, you know, they'll get up in the morning, and they'll put their left leg in and put their right foot out, and they stick it in the bathtub, and they shake it all about. You know, they call it the hokey pokey. <laughs> no, but seriously, everybody has some kind of tradition. You know, you may have a habit of doing something over and over and over again, whatever that may be. Could be work, 
could be that you, you know, get a cup of coffee first thing in the morning, or you hit the Starbucks at 6 a.m., or whatever it may be. Your habit, as it continues on a regular basis, can become a tradition if it's passed down from one generation to another generation. So a tradition is a habit, habitual remembrance of doing something year after year, meaning that it becomes something that becomes a tradition of a habit that you had started or had become a part of your life. Jews, as well as Chinese, Japanese, Buddhists, Muslims, well, even Mormons, and anybody else that's religious, including Catholics and Protestants and anybody else that's Christian, almost every religion has traditions. Traditions, traditions. If you remember from Tuvia in Fiddler on the Roof, you know, he sang that song, Traditions. And they are meant to bring about some kind of meaning, some kind of understanding of a purpose in life, a purpose that they were designed to do. The tradition of having Easter with Easter eggs and, and bunnies is simply having fun. I mean, why not? After all, it is a good day to have an Easter egg hunt. And it became a tradition because it was fun to do. It was a way to have children participate in the tradition of the Resurrection Day. And so it became a tradition to have Easter eggs and Easter bunnies and all the other fun things you do maybe on a picnic on Easter. Now I'll admit, you know, this is a little early in the year for picnicking, but it's warm enough. God seems to honor whatever day the Protestants and Catholics decide on Easter, which is supposed to be some Sunday after some summer or spring equinox, which is the way that they change the day to fit what it actually meant to be in the first place. Now, the normal tradition is, of course, that it's a part of Passover. It's, it's a prophecy that God said, hey, I'm going to cause a Passover lamb to be slain for the sins of the world, for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And I'm sure you've heard John 3.16 before. But that's kind of what the tradition is of what the purpose was designed to be. Now, over the years, it's been adapted and redacted and changed in some ways, but for the most part, the message still comes through. It's kind of a resurrection day. It's a very important day on the calendar of those that are calling themselves Christians, those that are Christ-like in being Christian, and those who are presumed to be Christians, even by a lot of people who aren't Christians. They all know what Easter is about. They may not participate in it, but they know what it means. You can think they don't, but bottom line is God has said that at some point in time, they knew. Now my tradition here at Vidivo Church is typically to do a lot of work on the internet, to post things, to promote things, to encourage people to seek the Lord while he may be found, to exhort them to find Jesus regardless of how or where they go, to do that with which they would do in order to celebrate the reality of the living Son of God whom we can know and we can demonstrate that knowledge by simply participating with realizing him every day in our life. In other words, we can listen and hear God speak. We can seek and we can see God move. We can open up our heart and allow God to change us. We can develop a personal relationship with Jesus today, just like they did after he rose from the dead. You see, before Jesus died, he said everything he would do. He promised a comforter, he sent the comforter. He said he would die, he died. He said he would rose, rise, he rose. Everything that he said he would do, he did. And he also said he's coming again. And because he's done all of these things that he said he would do, I feel pretty confident that he's going to do what he said he would do. 
since he rose from the dead, and then after 40 days, pretty much, rose in obviousness into the clouds, into the sky by 120 witnesses at least watching him, uh, in like manner, I'm pretty sure he's going to come back the same way. So since we have so great a cloud of witnesses that have stated these things, even before he was born, and then he did them, I'm pretty confident about what's going to happen. And so Easter, for a lot of people, is kind of a way of putting a check mark on what their religious duty is. You know, they, they sometimes go to church on Easter and Christmas and maybe some other day, like maybe a marriage or something. And, you know, oh, that's what a church looks like. <laughs> I admit that when I grew up, I had never been in a church. I had never gone to church. I had never gone to a Bible study or, let's see, what do they call them in those days? A sermon? Yeah, I'd never been to a sermon. I never heard a, a minister minister or a preacher preach or a priest priest. Of course, I didn't know that priests don't priest, but they bless the people and do religious duties. But I'd never seen any of that or been a part of it. I wasn't raised religiously. As a matter of fact, you know, I had to seek out on my own anything about God, because I was a science fiction reader, so I kind of understood about deities, but I never really thought about God or creation or anything like that. Like today's, you know, arguments that are going on throughout all of society, you know, people saying, well, we need to put God in the Bible or put God in the church or put God in the school or put God here, there, or everywhere. Well, I was pretty smart in those days as a kid, and if I would have heard those arguments, I'd have said, well, if he's God, he's already there, so why do you got to put him there? <laughs> you see, my mind doesn't work quite the same as some of these people that are debating things today, arguing things today, or wondering about things today. I kind of knew, just by logic, what truth should be. Now, I didn't know what the truth was. I just simply knew how to find truth by finding what was false and proving it. And most of the time I could prove what most people believed in as false. It was pretty easy because it was always contradictory. And maybe you are too. Maybe you've seen how much false there is in the world. You know, politicians telling you one thing and doing another. Or maybe even your family when you were growing up, your parents telling you one thing and doing another. Sometimes traditions are like that and that's kind of why it's funny to me to see today with Purim just over there to be a like Easter service, you know, going on. But okay, you know, I mean, if that's the way that Protestants and Catholics and most of the world is going to do it, then maybe we should look at it and enjoy it for what it was meant to be, not what it actually is. So just like President's Day, you know how they used to call that George Washington's birthday? And then later on, Abraham Lincoln's birthday. And then they decided that we had too many holidays, so they combined them and said, let's just call it President's Day and do it on a Monday. You know, changing the day in order to fit what was convenient. Well, that's kind of what they did with Easter this year. And it's not very convenient for Jewish people, but okay, fine. You know, if you're going to leave the Jews out, well, hey, that's the way it goes. But being that we're celebrating a day, and we're talking about the way that people do it, there's nothing wrong with having, you know, a family get together. There's nothing wrong with calling it Easter or calling it the Easter Bunny Day or having egg hunts. There's nothing wrong with even going to a sunrise service, no matter where you go. Because you see, God looks at the heart. You know, man for a long time has spent a lot of years working on what's on the outside. I mean, you used to have, you know, Salem witch trials where people were going about, you know, telling each other that they were wearing the wrong clothes or they gave the wrong look or they said the wrong words. So if you did that, you'd be put into what was called the stockades, meaning that the same kind of outfit that, you know, oxes or horses wear whenever they're pulling something, you know, kind of like they'd stick their neck through and then their <clears throat> shoulders, you know, would have this stock that would you know, have ropes attached to it, to a uh, cart, and it would pull it, kind of like, you know, dog sleds, you know, kind of same idea, a harness for the dogs. Well, they'd put you in a harness, and then everybody in the community would laugh at you, 
spit on you or throw rotten vegetables on you because you were in the stockades. You were being punished for doing something wrong because they didn't want, in those days, for you to affect them in some bad way. In a way, you know, it made sense to them. Today, it kind of would be called cruel and inhuman punishment, and we wouldn't even do that to our dogs or cats. The SPCA would come along and write you up or lock you up. But in those days, religious fervor and sometimes religious, you know, kind of like wrong thinking would do that to people. I imagine that's kind of what like FLDS was doing at one time with abusing what they were confusing about what technically was supposed to be the Mormon religion. Now, I'm not a Mormon, and, you know, Mormons have their own religion that they follow and do. But unfortunately, Jeffs was one of those kind of guys that changed it and rearranged it and made it into what he wanted. Well, I would have thought that somebody would have taken care of it until finally somebody did. The law of the land. Well, that's kind of what they used to do in the old days. You know, they were trying to fix the outside by ruining the inside. And most people that are caught up in cults or false religion usually are messed up on the inside. They don't see something, experience something, and know something that we do on a day like today. Joy. <laughs> you know, joy. Now, I admit, I don't go to sunrise services by someone else because... It's also formal, you know, I mean, you got to wait for the band leader to do the band. You got to wait for the religious leader to do the religion. You got to wait for the singers to sing, you know, and you can't just laugh out loud, have fun, enjoy it. You know, the very first Easter is more like what I like. You know, I like to kind of take some time alone, you know. I, I like to play Mary more than I like to play Peter or Paul or John or you know, the Ringos or the Beatles. I don't want to go to a sunrise service and, you know, sit in a chair and kind of watch everything that's going on and being told what was there. You know, I have gone to the sunrise service at the Garden Tomb. Wow, was that a letdown. <laughs> they were lined up for, I mean, you, you shuffled them in and shuffled them out because, to put it bluntly, they have service after service after service after service after service. I mean, you know, all day long, there are churches having services at the Garden Tomb. And they rush you in, sit you down, have their service, rush you out. And the next church brings it in, you know, one after another. But the interesting thing is, it's not about what they do, but what you do inside. You see, it's interesting that I can say that I've been to, you know, the Garden Tomb. Yeah, I was there. Oh, sunrise. Or, you know, stood on Mount Rubido in Riverside, you know, for the sunrise service at the cross. Or Calvary Chapel at Irvine, or not Irvine, I can't think of the center that it is. Or instead, when you went to the beach and just watched, you know, the sunrise come over the Saddleback Mountain, <laughs> technically. Can't always see it because it's small, but, you know, basically. Or different places I've lived when I was, like, out on Tritigan Arm, you know, watching the sunrise in Alaska. Or even last year, pretty sure it was last year, going up on top of um, Antelope Island. I can't think of the name of the mountain, but we went on top, my wife and I. And we were going to watch sunrise. I mean, we camped out. We planned on getting up before dawn and hiking all the way up. Then I realized how far that was, and I went, we might not make it at sunrise. So we made it technically later in the day. And that's kind of okay, because you see, that's what happened with the disciples. Mary was the one who ran to the tomb, or at least she was walking to the tomb, and she didn't really expect to find Jesus alive. Matter of fact, she expected to see a dead carcass, and she was just doing her tradition of Jewish women going to a body and kind of, you know, doing cleanup work, you know, cleaning off all the blood, which had already been cleaned off, but, you know, kind of preparing it for spices and things to last for a while so it wasn't so stinketh, you know, as some bodies do. And usually after a few days, you know, the body expiates, you know, all of its bodily fluids. And so she was going to 
by way of her love for Jesus, clean him up, you know, kind of prepare the body and wrap it up in holiness, wrap it up in her love and affection. And so she went there with probably someone else, we don't know, but it says her, and she found, dare I say, something she didn't expect. And maybe that's what we should be learning about traditions today. Maybe God wants to invade your day. Maybe at an Easter egg hunt. Maybe at a picnic. Maybe somewhere along the way. Maybe like the road to Emmaus, as a lot of people will be teaching on that, you know, kind of surprise the two who were walking away from Jerusalem, discussing how bad it had been for Jesus and how he died and they thought he was the Messiah. And then to have him kind of show up and being so distorted by being beaten and his face all messed up and scarred and kind of like without blood, but still pretty messed up beyond recognition. They didn't recognize him, but have him explain to them the scriptures and how everything was fulfilled. Somewhere along the way, we have all these things happening today, at least the tradition of today. Maybe not this day, back then, but on Resurrection Day, on the day that Jesus rose from the grave. With that in mind, I think about what I like to do about my tradition, which is simply to put on Godspell, a musical I love to watch, maybe put on Ten Commandments, which last night was on TV and I watched it. It was kind of fun. You know, Yul Brynner and, you know, Charlton Heston and Though Moses stuttered, you know, our image of Moses is kind of like, you know, big brawny guy, and he was really probably like a limpy little, you know, kind of mama's boy. But anyways, um, you know, it was fun to watch. It inspires me. It may not be accurate, but it inspires me. Godspell is certainly not accurate, but the music and the worship and the joy is. So what I see as a tradition today that is more important than maybe the tradition you're doing. Like maybe you went to a sunrise service and you didn't get anything out of it. Or maybe you got cold. Or maybe you're catching a cold. I think today is more important about what's going on the inside than it is what's going on the outside. Now, the tomb on the outside, everybody was pretty bummed out. They were about their own business, doing their own thing, enjoying, or in this case, depressed as all get out, sitting in some room trying to figure out, what do we do now? I mean, they had gotten together for the Sabbath. They stayed together because Passover was ending. It was a Saturday, so they had to stay together as a group. And sure enough, the disciples were all gathered there because it was the Passover. It was also the Sabbath. But then the first day of the week, they were ready to go out and do their duty, go to business, go to work go to their jobs, go to do whatever they figured out they were going to do next. And then God invaded their day. God appeared in their midst. God blew them away. God did not find faithful men. He found questions. He found wonderment. He found them not knowing what they were doing. And that's the most important thing I think that you should realize today if you're religious. If you're religious and you've really got these set agendas for Easter and how it's got to be, maybe you should learn from the disciples a little bit about letting go and letting God. God might not want you to do a sunrise service. Maybe you aren't healthy enough to go get up in the morning, you know, and catch a service today at all. Maybe you're going to be laying in bed and watch TV or I don't know, I think March this year is, it's the Easter's in March, you know, go figure. But, you know, March Madness, I guess, I don't know. I don't even know if there's basketball on TV today, but maybe there is. Maybe you want to watch that. But that's something you choose to do. And today, people choose to do what they want to do on Resurrection Sunday. Some will choose to put on a cantata you know, a major musical production to celebrate. He's alive, he's alive, he's alive and I'm forgiven, you know, blah, blah, blah. Or after Lent, you know, um, do some major Christian mass, you know, like Catholics do, or, 
or Byzantine do, or Armenians do, or Greeks do, Greek Orthodox. Um, those are cool. I mean, I like watching them. I don't participate in them, but I, I like watching them. They're kind of interesting. You know, you know, why not? I mean, kind of fun to see. But today, more than any other day, is a day to examine your heart, not theirs. Today's more of a day to examine what you do in your life as a tradition. I mean, you know, if it's only to maybe even help someone else with theirs, maybe that's something that's kind of fun to do for you as a resurrection of your childlike nature. Maybe today you need to be resurrected from, you know, kind of your dead duties that you've been doing all week. And maybe today's a good day to get out on the lake or go fishing or spend some time alone. I mean, if you're not a Christian, then go do what you like to do and maybe God will invade your day today because somebody somewhere, I'm sure, is probably praying for you. Maybe you don't want to be a part of all this resurrection day and you don't want to even be a part of Easter bunnies or egg hunts. And that's okay. You see, Jesus didn't rise from the dead and say, hey, here I am, now go out and tell everybody. No. He had already said what he wanted everyone to do about teaching, preaching, and celebrating his life. He simply fulfilled what he said he would do. And that maybe is something we all need to learn about Resurrection Day. He did what he said, and he said what he did. I think today in our modern world, we have a lot of people that say one thing and do another. They don't live up to their word. They don't do what they promised they would do. And that's let a lot of people down. I know a lot of millennials will, you know, Google churches and find out how many contradictions there are and oftentimes not even go to church. But that doesn't mean that God is wrong. They just haven't asked the right questions sometimes. Because Resurrection Day isn't about a church. It isn't about a sunrise service. It isn't about you or me. It's simply, there's a guy who said he would do what he did, and he did it. And he followed through by God raising him from the dead. And because he did what he said, that means what he said is true. And that's the most important part of any tradition that we have or that we do about God or Jesus. It isn't about church service. It isn't about, oh, you know, kind of like, you know, hiding some eggs and putting some money in them or whatever you may do with eggs or bunnies or mass or <laughs> whatever everybody else does today. But it's more important to realize that I'm going to die one of these days and I want to be resurrected. I want to be, you know, alive forevermore. I want to rise from not only the grave, but I want to rise up into heaven. I want to go where Jesus is because he promised he would take me where he was. He promised me, as a matter of fact, when I became a follower of his, when I became born again of the spirit and not of the flesh, when I decided to follow Jesus, he said that he would never leave me nor forsake me. And God knows I tried to prove him wrong and failed miserably. He's never left me. And that's kind of why I like to think about what my tradition is today. It reminds me that he will do what he said he will do. It reminds me that the only lesson I need to learn today isn't about church or love or resurrection or Jesus or God, but that he said it, he did it. And he's true. You see, a lot of people argue about what is truth. Just like Pontius Pilate said, what is truth to Jesus? Jesus really didn't completely answer because Jesus is the truth. Everything is about him because he's the one who is true. There's no true Christian or true church or true believer or true this or true that. There is the truth. And Jesus said, I am the truth. I am the way. 
I am the life. And after he said it, he went out and proved it. And that's what today's about, is the proof is in the pudding. The proof is in the day. The proof is in the man. Jesus said a lot of things that I think people are forgetting today. And I would rather remind them of what he said and did than to get caught up in good traditions, bad traditions, weird traditions, strange tradition, traditions or predictions or anything else. I think I would rather remember Jesus said it and Jesus did it. So if I could put to you the most important thing today as I listen to turtle doves sing and I keep thinking, I know they're talking. <laughs> they're talking and I'm listening and I'm hearing them. But if I could say anything to you today, I mean this, you know, 2016 as it were, you know, and pretty nice day it looks like going to be or will be. But such as it is early, you know, in traditions and not necessarily the actual day, but in the day that they've chosen to make Easter this year and being that it is a resurrection day that we celebrate, then I would say the most important thing for you to remember is Jesus said it, and Jesus did it. If anything, that should be the one thing you take away from today. Not whatever you're doing or whatever family you're with or not with or whatever guilt or shame or forgiveness or mercy or love or eternal life you have, but rather the one most important thing that I think is more important than all of that, I mean even eternal life, and that is Jesus said it, and Jesus did it, and that you can count on. So today, think about that. Go back maybe and find what Jesus said. Go back and read about what went on, and you can say, oh, well, you know, they made this up or made that up, or they argue about this and argue about that, and that's fine. But what about talking to Jesus? What about Jesus, if he really did rise from the dead? Where did he go? What's he doing now? And can you find out? Because I got news for you that maybe you're not going to be told, but you could ask him. <laughs> if he rose from the dead, then he's got to be somewhere, so maybe you could get a hold of him and talk to him about it. Maybe you could get it straight from the horse's mouth and maybe that's the problem with why you don't accept what church is doing. You don't believe what religion is saying. And you reject the traditions of man for what they are. And I don't blame you. <laughs> Frankly, it was a little weird to me, too. And I had to kind of wonder, why are they doing that? And I had to spend a lot of years studying why people do what they do. Because, frankly, even after being a Christian for a long time, I didn't get it either. I don't understand why they're doing that. Why are you doing that? You know, what's that all about? You know, that's not what Jesus said, but okay. And so I learned that it wasn't important about what they're doing, but what's inside that counts. And so that's why I began to realize maybe I should find out what Jesus said. Because so far that I've been around and I've been, quote, saved or been a Christian or followed Jesus for over 40 years of my life, the one thing I've been able to hold true to, no matter what anyone else does, or even what I do, is the reality of the fact that Jesus said it, and Jesus did it, and Jesus never lied, and everything he said came true, and everything he said that is going to come true will come true. So I wanted to know everything he had to say. And some of it was pretty powerful. It wasn't all about, you know, some kind of like wussy kind of feeling, touchy, you know, everything's going to be hunky-dory fine. Matter of fact, when I read the book of Revelation, I began to realize Jesus said some things that were pretty serious about how I'm living and what I'm doing and where I'm going and how I'm going to get there. I began to realize, you know, it's not all, you know, sweet sugar and spice and everything nice and just go to church and you'll be okay. Uh, I began to realize, you know, there's some things inside I got to deal with and admit, even though I may not be able to change them, God will eventually, even if it takes death, eventually inside my innards will be changed because my outers will be gone. 
So today, no matter what you see on the outside of anyone, just remember, Jesus said he's working on the inside and that he's going to bring outside what he wants to develop and incorporate in your life. It's not about what you're doing out here, you know, works and trips and, you know, putting on religious jargon or a suit and tie or whatever it is you're going to do today or even what you eat or drink or celebrate, you know what I mean? If anything, it's kind of weird because I'm a Pepsi drinker and I'm drinking a Coke. <laughs> How's that for contradiction? But what Jesus said he would do was change us on the inside. And eventually that would reflect on the outside. But more important than that, I just want to remember that during Passover, he said he would rise from the dead. And during Passover, on the first day of the week after the Passover, he rose from the dead. Because he said it, they were expecting, or should have been expecting, for him to do it. And they weren't. And I'm sure, like you, you probably are expecting a lot of things. Maybe accurately, maybe not. But one thing I can tell you, you can't count on. If Jesus said it, he will 